All right, so hello, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, um, and greetings from Philadelphia. My name is Akoswa Akwado, and I am an admissions officer in the University of Pennsylvania's undergraduate admissions office. And I'll let my colleague introduce herself. Thank you. My name is Madeline Jacobs, a she, her pronouns. I'm an associate director of admissions at Penn, and I'm so excited to have the moment to speak with you all today about selective international admissions. Great. Um, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to, to learning more about the selective admissions, not just at Penn, but just across the United States. And before we get started, I'd first like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, Penn occupies the traditional homeland of Lene Lenape. We acknowledge this in gratitude for the indigenous people, both past and present, for the opportunity to live and learn on Lenape Hoken, land of the Lenape. All right, so a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, before we get kicked into the session. Um, the, you are disabled in terms of your, your, your video and sound. You can see us, but we can't see you, but I'm sure you are all lovely. Um, this is a webinar. You can use the, the Q&A box. I see a few of you are already using it. The chat is disabled as well as that raised hand feature. We have closed captioning here for you as well if you, are, if you need it, but you are able to turn it on and off as needed as we go through the session. And as I said, with so many people joining us today, we're already at 451 participants, and I'm sure that may, well, it's growing <laughs> as, as we go through the session. So we want to launch a poll to get a sense of where everyone is joining us from. Um, so I'm going to launch this poll, and you can just answer, give us your geographic location, um, when you're going to graduate high school, and what is what are you most excited for at Penn? So you can just answer those questions as we see it coming through. Don't be shy. We're all a community here today. All right, so we see a lot of people coming in from East Asia and Southeast Asia, Europe, Middle East. Oceania is coming through just a little bit here. Just a tad. All right, so looking at the graduation, there's a lot of 2024 graduates. Some people who've already graduated, some um, family and parents joining us, as well as counselors. Welcome to everyone. And seeing what people are most excited about, the deafening win here is exploring academic interests and research. Love to see it, as well as some joining clubs and making new friends. <laughs> I'm also seeing here people are interested in, in trying a Philly cheesesteak. If you are vegan and vegetarian, there are also vegan and vegetarian options. Fun fact to take with you. Okay. I'm going to end the poll here. Well, it's so great to get your participation. Um, and I love to see the cl graduating class of 2024 and families and counselors joining us. So for today's agenda, we are going to discuss a little more about the finding your fit in, in different institutions. This is a general conversation about selective institutions as my colleague Madeline already mentioned, not necessarily dedicated just to Penn. I wanna give you a glimpse of how to navigate um, applying to university, colleges and universities in the United States. We're also gonna talk a little bit about application plans and deadlines, talk a little bit about financial aid, and also get, get you a sense of what goes through the admissions process overall, and also what to expect next. As you, you this summer, and as you go through the, the fall or autumn semester, thinking about how to apply and how to navigate the application process. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit of, um, with Q&A. So please, again, add your questions to the Q&A box, and we'll have people in the background answering those questions. And at the end, if we have time, we'll be able to answer some questions. We always run out of time. Then not all the questions are able to be answered, but you can continue to utilize all our, our webinars and sessions that we'll have throughout the season, as well as our YouTube page, our social media. We are on TikTok. So as you're scrolling TikTok, you can learn more information about Penn as well. And I'll pass that to my colleague, Madeline. Thank you so much. What a great introduction, Akosua. So thinking about finding your fit, it's really important to think about the type of institution where you want to spend four years. So some factors that you should take into consideration are going to be location. 
do you want a warm climate or a cold climate? Uh, do you want there to be a specific um, topological uh, element of it? Thinking about the size, do you want a large institution or a small institution? Um, academic programs, this is a really important one. Thinking about what you might want to study, knowing that you may change your mind, but think about what types of schools have which majors and academic programs. Are you interested in studying um, biology? Does the school offer that program? If you're interested in studying the humanities, is there strength in those areas? So really think about what you might want to focus on and then see which schools could best support those interests. Some students may be very undecided. And so think about which schools may be good for that undecided exploratory path. Campus life is another big part of it. Going back to geographic location, think about if you wanna be in a more urban setting, if you wanna be in a rural area, um, are you interested in a certain type of sport that requires being near mountains or near an ocean? Um, and then life after college, a great question that you can ask as you go about your search processes, what are typical career paths of graduates? What do thing, What are things that students do with X, Y, or Z degree? So remember that there are over 5,000 institutions in the United States, even more internationally. And so it's important to start thinking about what you're looking for first and foremost, and then from there, thinking about which schools can support you and your academic journey. Further, we kind of touched on academics a little bit. Social, you know, maybe you're interested in getting involved in Greek life or athletics. Uh, maybe you want a smaller community where everybody knows everybody. Maybe you want a really large campus community where you might not know all of the students. And then, of course, financial. Um, as an international applicant, it's very important that you're clear on what the financial aid support and opportunities are for scholarships or grants at each of the institutions that you're going to be applying for. We'll touch on financial aid a little bit more later, but just remember that these should be really top headers on your list. Um, and then you're filling in the details as you go further, thinking about what different campuses can offer. So have an open mind. Remember that a school's ranking on you know, new, new estimates, the world report, it may be not the best school for you. So really remember that what is the best fit may not mean that it's number one on a list. Um, remember that you are the one that has to spend the four years on that campus. We want it to be a good and enjoyable experience for you. So the opinions of others in your community, of course, it's hard to isolate uh, your search from that, but remember that this is your process. It's your decision, and it really should be up to you to make that final say of where you apply and where you matriculate. So think about creating a balanced list. And when we say balanced, it's typically good to have sort of a, a reach school. So a school that may be, you know, a very selective or a, a more challenging to get into, have a, a, a match school or something that you were pretty confident that you would be um, admitted and, you know, it's really on level with your academics and your profile. And then finally have a safety school or a few safety schools where you're very confident in your chances of admission and you're really glad to have those as a backup. Make sure that every school on your list is somewhere that you would actually be excited to attend and you would be ready to go there. Um, knowing that different selectivity rates and different outcomes, it changes every year. And so really make sure that you're crafting a list with a good balance of schools. Don't only apply to safety, don't only apply to reach schools um, and make sure that you're really taking into the factors that I mentioned earlier, academic fit, location, campus life, et cetera, when thinking about each school that's going to be on your list. So now Akosa is gonna talk a little bit about the actual mechanics of the application process. Thank you, Madeline. So approaching your, your, the process overall, what systems do we use? There's different systems that institutions use, so, right? so we have the Common App, the Coalition App, or other applications. Other applications, some schools choose to outside of the a platform like the Common App or the Coalition App have their own system that they utilize to collect information. That information is around your academics, things related to your recommendations, and a general understanding of why you're interested in that situ in 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 that um, institution. Excuse me. Right. So thinking of looking, doing your research and thinking about what the, the school is looking for in terms of the, the, the platform that they, they would like you to utilize is really important as you gather your information. 
Additionally, looking at other, there's other applications as well. Again, um, there's a, the QuestBridge application, as I said, institutions also utilize their own. And also thinking about the admission times, right? There's different terms that you're going to, to be hearing as you go through this process. And we acknowledge very much that it can be confusing for you and your family and your team. They're help supporting you in this application process. So we wanna just talk a little bit of, briefly about what each of them mean. So early decision, it's a binding application. It means that once you apply to that institution, you cannot apply early decision for any other institution is binding. If you get into that institution, that is where you are going. Early action is a non-binding decision. Restrictive early action is also non-binding, but has some restrictions as to which schools that you can apply to overall. And regular decision is regular decision provides students the time to apply to multiple institutions. And going back to the early decision, early action and restrictive early action, that is typically due around early November. So that requires a lot of planning. As Madeline mentioned earlier, in terms of having a balance for you and having that balance, you know what schools you're able to apply early decision and what schools you're, you're not able to and why you're thinking about applying early decision. A lot of times students ask us, do you want me to apply early decision? Do these schools want me to apply early decision? And that should be up to you and your support team. What, what do you feel most fitting? Early decision is, is for, for students and you find that that school is a place for you. If you get in, you're booking a plane ticket and getting on a red eye flight and, and coming to the school. You're so deeply excited about it. And that is your, the place that you want to be. Right? And, and so really thinking about that is really important because you have to look at the policies behind those, those um, systems. So thinking about regular decision as well. Regular decision, as I said, is non-binding, and that typically is due early January. So it gives you a little bit of time between the summer months, the fall and, and the autumn to really continue to think about, to refine, to ask questions about your getting your, your academic files from your, your schools, writing your, your interest pieces, right? Talking about your supplements, et cetera, it gives you a little more time. So in early January, you provide that. Again, it is non-binding, so you can apply to multiple schools with regular, with regular admission and then decide later when you get your decision around early, early um, around spring, um, thinking about which one you would like to go to. And that also, again, we're talking more about financial aid that also goes into that decision as well. Rolling in admission provides you more time, so it's it's rolling. It means it just keeps going, right? There's not a set time that you have to apply, and you you get your decision in a rolling basis. So you get your decision once you apply. There's a time period that you'll get it. There's not one time period that you're going to get that decision, unlike regular decision and the early decisions, where usually they will tell you there's a set date that everyone will be getting that decision. So again, it's very important for you to learn about these policies in the different institutions and make sure you're abiding by them. U.S. institutions, are, when they talk about these, these um, the policies around early decision, early action, restrictive, regular decision, they're very we are very particular about that. So make sure you know the policies. It shouldn't be a period where you say you don't know about it it's because you should have done your research to learn about what these policies are in these different institutions. When you're thinking about applying to Penn, um, you know, just as an example, again, we want to provide information for all institutions during this presentation, but we do know lots of specifics about our school. So we accept either Common App or Coalition App, no preference between the platforms, truly. It's just a difference in formatting. We are an early decision binding school, so it's only for those who know that Penn is your first choice. Um, and we also, of course, offer regular decision. It's regular decision, it's not late decision. So really apply when is most comfortable for you. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about financial aid. There are different types, and it's really important that you understand the differences in these types of aid, again, before you apply. When counseling students, I always recommend that you create a spreadsheet, maybe a Google Doc, maybe an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of maybe application deadlines, keep track of financial aid policies, because it does vary by school. So let's talk about grants and scholarships versus loans. 
a grant or a scholarship is money that you receive that you do not pay back to the university. It's sort of like a discount on that tuition. A loan is they will front you that money, but then you do pay that money back either to the university or to an affi affiliated bank. Um, and you'll pay that money back over time after graduation. Loan payments will not start until after you've matriculated, you've finished um, your degree and started working. There are different types of scholarships. There's going to be merit-based, typically for scholarships, and then need-based tends to be either for scholarships or for grants. Again, I'll give the example of Penn. Many different schools have different policies, but at Penn, we do need-based aid and we do grants. So we don't have any scholarships and nothing is based on merit, or some schools also have athletic scholarships. At Penn, we just do need-based. Merit-based is based on your academic performance. It could be your GPA, it could be test scores, it could be performance in a certain academic area. Need-based is based on your family's financial ability to pay that tuition. So it really is based on your family's income, any assets that you have, and any other expenses. Maybe you have a sibling who is enrolled in university, or maybe you have family medical bills or something like that. So evaluate all that information and then cover the difference between what your family can pay and the total cost of that tuition. Need blind versus need aware. And I saw a few questions about this in the chat. So I'm glad that we are covering this. Need blind means that a student's need for financial aid has no bearing on their admissions decision. So we have no idea if you need financial aid, uh, we would have no idea how much financial aid you might need. Um, and we're just making a decision based on the parts of the application, the Common App, Coalition App, Transcript, Recommendations, et cetera. Need aware means that we are uh, cognizant of how much need aid that you have. We do know that you are applying for financial aid and how much money that you might need to cover that cost, either in grants, scholarships or loans, again, depends on the institution, it's really going to vary and it's going to impact uh, your admissions decision. So know that at Penn, we are need aware for international students that are reside outside of North America. But again, many schools have different policies. There are institutions in the United States that are fully need blind for international students. So it's always good to check on the different policies. It's really important that, um, these are some of the specifics for Penn. Um, the financial aid, a couple of tips on screen, I think would help you prepare for the application process. You do need to apply for financial aid. You are not automatically considered for it. So as always observe those deadlines very carefully. In general, the rule of thumb is that the application is due at the same time as financial aid documents. So you wanna make sure that when you're ready to submit that application, you're also ready with your financial aid materials. Sometimes schools may have different timelines and deadlines, but generally you wanna have everything together at the same time. Um, know that if you do submit your financial aid documents late, it's not guaranteed that you would get your financial aid package at the same time as your admissions decision. And we wouldn't want you to miss out on the opportunity to get financial aid support just because you missed a deadline. Um, make sure that you take the opportunity to explain any special circumstances, extenuating um, uh, situations that may happen or may occur within your family, Make sure that you're talking to your family early. Make sure that you are all on the same page about what your financial aid need is and what types of aid you are going to be applying for. Apologies for any background noise. It's great to leverage the information and resources that your school may have. If you have a school counselor or a college counselor, they may have a wealth of information that can help you through this process. We do have tools that can help students through the application process get a sense of how much aid they might receive. So I always encourage students to use the My Intuition or the Net Price Calculator. And these are tools available on the websites of just about every school that you'll be applying for. So now I'm gonna hand it back over to Akosa to share a little bit about the admissions. 
Great. So get an inside view of the admissions process. As we look through all these institutions, look through your, your, applic your application, what are they looking for? What are they thinking about? And you will hear the, this language a lot as you go through diff two different sessions. You hear this, this language as holistic review or whole person review. This means that we're looking at various features, right? It's not just your academic information, it's not just your, your extracurriculars, it's not just your recommendations, but all the pieces that make you you, right? We always talk about students being containing multitudes, right? You're not just your academics, you're not just your fa a family member, you're not just a community member, you contain all these different pieces of yourself and contain all these histories and contacts. And the best way for us to capture that is to use a holistic review process, right? So we're looking at your academic information, um, as I, I mentioned a little earlier, and this academic information is at this at the, a lot of times at the center, but again, not the only piece in which we are looking at. This academic information allows us to get a sense of where you are in your academics. And in saying that, we very much understand how different internet globally academics looks like. And our wonderful admissions officers have a clear sense of what is going on globally and what is going on in your schools. So you're at at times, your schools will provide us something called a school report, and that gives us a sense of what is available at your school, whether it be an IB curriculum, um, whether it be um, another AP curriculum, anything that is available at your school, we get a sense of it. We have open communications with your, your counselors and your community-based organizations in which you may be a part of. We're not looking for particular academic paths for our students because we very much understand how different it is globally. Next, we're thinking a lot about you and your extracurriculars and your involvement. As I said earlier, right, it's not just about the academic pieces. Extracurricular involvement can look like various things. I was looking in the chat earlier and just getting some questions of what are you looking for in those extracurriculars? We're looking for what excites you. What do you, are you involved in? Are you a student who is involved in um, um, soccer or, or football, as it's called in most of the world, right? Are you somebody who is interested in different kinds of sports in your communities? Are you somebody who has who has taken on teaching um, younger peers? All the extracurriculars that you are involved in, again, since we, we can see our, a lot of institutions are global spaces, you're seeing various things coming from students and extracurriculars look very different across the world and we want to see that reflected. Your recommendations, right? Recommendations, another way for us to get a sense of how your, your teachers, your community members are talking about you. So the recommendations allow institutions to get a better sense of you. You are not gonna talk about yourself in the same way that your recommenders are. Yeah. And a lot of times you, you, you sometimes misdescribe yourself because you're not perhaps as confident, but the recommenders provide us great insight into who you are and get us a better sense of you. Right next, we have your essays, sometimes short answers. And those essays, again, you are talking about yourself. You're talking about um, why you're interested in the institution and also talking about something you, you like to talk further about. The coalition and the Common App have different prompts for you to, to write about. And all these, these prompts give us a better sense of uh, where you're coming from and your context and your histories. I must, I must say essays are one of the, the greatest pieces and, and um, honors to learn more about students and the context in which you're bringing to institutions. And next, we have the interviews. Interview is also another way for, for um, institutions to get to know you better. Sometimes these interviews are done by alums, sometimes they're done by admissions officers. Really learning more about the policies and who conducts the interview is also really important. Here at Penn, the interviews are conducted by our wonderful alumni. And the interview is just a way for the institution to get to know you better. I know hearing the word interviews is sometimes feels a little scary, very much understand that. But if we can rephrase that, think about it as a conversation rather than an interview, right? A conversation for you to learn more about the institution. So feel free to ask questions to the, to the person who is interviewing you, or rather you're having a conversation with to learn more about the institution. And with the person you're having a conversation with, you know, they will ask you why you're interested in this institution to get a better sense again of, of your interest at the institutions, whether it be academic or social. All right, so we, in your application process, we are learning about your, your um, different academic information, right? So the academic information, we're in looking at it in different parts. We're learning about the courses that is offered at your school. 
we're learning about the, the rigor of the curriculum. And we're learning about the grade trends as well as the standardized tests um, that you will be taking, right? So in thinking about the courses offered, again, I was seeing in the, in the chat that students were, some were a little worried perhaps, that you were not able to um, take an IB curriculum, for example, right? And in the courses offered at your high school, that doesn't mean that you have to take an IB curriculum. A lot of institutions are not looking for that because we very much understand how different things are across the world. So we want to be able to honor that well and think about what is available to, to you at your school. And again, in thinking about the, the rigor of the curriculum, right? How, how um, challenging is it for you? So that being said, right, in the context of your school, we also wanna make sure you're challenging yourself within, within the rigor of the curriculum available to you. Thinking about your, your grade trends overall, and that information is again provided on the, on the, um, your, the transcript that your school provides to us. Right, the grade trends looking at how you've advanced throughout your, your first year um, to your last year. And in thinking about the grade trends, a lot of times we very much understand how COVID is still having an impact across the world, right? How COVID has had an impact on you, and that is that is okay. It has it had an impact on all of us. And we we again want to be all of all institutions want to be able to take care and think about that. So there's a part called additional information. And if you feel that your, your, your grade trends were a, a little wobbly, right? And you, 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 you brought it up or you're still trying to bring it up, the additional information section provides you more opportunity to talk to the institution and to let all of us, to let us know what happened or, or, or the reasoning behind it just to get a sense of it. And again, with the standardized tests, again, saw some questions in the chat talking about interest a little bit in the standardized test, really can, at least it's test optional, but for the upcoming cycle, but it's also important to look at other institutions and look at their policies around test standardized testing, so the SATs and the ACTs, looking at the policies that the in institutions have on their websites, um, to get information about what is the policies around standardized testing. And as I said, it's test optional for the 2023-2024 cycle with accession to the English language testing, which we'll, we will go into more detail about later. Um, and the next question people ask is really test optional, really are test optional. But again, it's really important for you to look at the policies of the institutions and to get a, a sense of what they mean by test optional. Um, or if they, they are test optional, for example, again, it's really important not to see it as a blanket for all institutions, but making sure you're doing the research to better understand the policies of is, each institution. All right, so thinking about recommendations, I will pass it over to Madeline. So recommendations, we look at very closely because they give us a sense of what you might be like on our campus inside our classroom. And yes, there's so many parts of college, but we are first and foremost academic institutions. You're coming to learn and grow intellectually as well as a person, as a community member. So thinking about recommendations, we do ask that you have at least one recommendation um, from a teacher. Different schools will have different policies. Some will ask for two teacher recommendations um, and they should be from core academic areas. So any ac an academic area would mean anything other than physical education, art, or a health class. So any class where there are tests, you're using pencils, you're studying, um, there is homework. So that could include, you know, history, English, a math, a uh, science. That could also include an economics course. That could include a philosophy course or religion. Um, that could be a world language course. So really any academic area. Um, it is better to ask teachers that you've had more recently, so maybe in your 11th year or 12th year of school, because they've known you most recently, they know what you're probably going to be like more closely to the time you're going to be matriculating to a campus. Asking a teacher that you had maybe in ninth or 10th year or perhaps even earlier than that, it's okay in some situations, but we do prefer they be more recent just because that's what you're more like closer to the application process. Um, so recent teachers, 
Uh, many schools in, will ask for a counselor recommendation. So uh, that could be from a guidance counselor, that could be from a college counselor, again, one that works at your school. Um, somebody that you may be working with independently outside of school would not be qualified for this type of recommendation. Uh, a common question that we get is, I don't have a school counselor. In that situation, getting a different school official, perhaps a principal or assistant principal or another administrator to write on your behalf would be okay in that situation. Um, and then just help provide general context about who you are in that community. So the teachers are really speaking more to inside the classroom and that school counselor or that school official is speaking to what you may be like both academically, but also in terms of extracurriculars, how you engage with students and faculty in the community writ large. And then many schools will have the opportunity for an optional letter of recommendation. Remember that if it says optional, it truly is optional. Plenty of students are admitted without a supplemental letter, but some students feel that their file may be incomplete without this additional context. So that could come from somebody like a coach of a sporting team. It could come from a mentor. It could come from someone who sponsors a club that you have or somebody you may have worked with. Make sure that if you do have an additional letter that's coming in, that it adds something new to the application that has not already been said. So if you've already gotten a math teacher to write for you, perhaps you don't need another math letter recommendation. If you know that your counselor is already going to talk about your engagement in a given activity, maybe you don't need the sponsor of that activity to write your letter. So we're really looking at all of these together. And again, look at the policy of the specific school you're applying to and see how many letters of recommendation they accept, because that's how many letters of recommendation they will read. If a student submits 20 letters of recommendation, we probably won't read all 20 of them if our school only accepts four. So be thoughtful about who you're asking. It sounds obvious, but ask people that really know you well, that can really speak to your character, to your academic performance, um, and are going to speak positively about you. Perhaps there's a teacher that's notorious for being a challenging teacher, it's a tough class, um, but they don't know you as well. We would prefer to have a different teacher who really has worked more closely with you, even if they're not known as being you know, the toughest teacher in school. Um, and again, make sure that they're from core academic areas. And if, as, if they are from a more recent year, so 11th or 12th year, that is certainly preferred in a lot of institutions. As always, if you have questions about who would be a qualified recommender, always reach out to the schools that you're applying to. At Penn, our policy is we ask for one counselor letter, one teacher letter, and then the third letter of recommendation could either be from a teacher or it could be from a different type of recommender, recognizing students might know, not know their teachers as well as they may have liked given remote instruction. Um, so as promised, uh, we are going to talk a little bit more about the application review. So Akoso is gonna walk us through sort of what are these other qualities that we are considering. And thank you, Madeline. Right, so thinking about the application review, I said earlier that thinking about a holistic or a whole person review aligns with these, these components, right? We're not just looking at your academics, right? We're looking at how you, you will be, all institutions, these institutions are looking at how you will be members of the school community. So institutions are looking at the, your, your personality, just to get a sense of, of what, what are you excited about, right? What you're writing about in your Common App or Coalition or the other applications, but right? your accomplishments, and that can be seen through your extracurriculars or how your recommenders um, talk about you. Your motivation and drive, I think that goes a little bit into the personalities, right? Your, your personality speaks to your motivation and drive, not just for the institution, but the institution that you were applying to, but overall, right? Why are you interested in that institution? Would you, you seek to do it in the near future or the further future? Thinking about your experiences overall, all over the world, as we, we got in the poll earlier, you're all coming from various countries, but in those various countries, you have, you have your own personal histories and contacts within all these spaces. We institutions want to better understand your experiences, and also thinking about alignment, right? Applying your, doesn't necessarily mean that applying to all these schools, you're going to be in, in, aligned with all of them and that is okay, right? Thinking about the alignment is also important as you, for you and for the institution as well. 
And we also ask ourselves a few questions as we look through your, your applications. First, we think about what kind of impact will the student make on the institution, right? Or, or on, on their campus. The impact, not just in the classroom again, but in those extracurriculars, right? I was looking through earlier about what everyone was seeking to gain from this, this webinar and thinking about making friends. What impacts are you going to make on your friends? What impacts are you going to make on the research interests that many of you may have? What impacts are you going to, to make on um, the different clubs that you join, the different social groups that you're joining on institutions? All right, well, we also asking ourselves, what do you want to get out of, of our institution? We have institutions offer various things to students in a plethora of ways, right? So what are you thinking about getting from the institution within your four years and beyond as well? And then next, we think about what, is you, what do you care about as a student? Right? Are you interested in, in, in thinking about climate change? Are you somebody, what who, who is thinking about new research for cancer studies, all these different things we're, we're asking ourselves. Are you somebody who is interested in the social sciences and history and thinking about the history of your, your, your countries and, and or, or the world in general and how it connects to each other? Right? We're asking ourselves all these questions because we want to think about how you become a community member. A community member, again, I, I reiterate this, right? Not just in the classroom, but in, within the institution and how you seek to interact with your professors as well as your peers. Right. All right. Okay. Go ahead, Madeline. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so thinking about the admissions process, uh, one of the big pieces that may be applicable for a lot of international students is going to be English language testing. So there are a couple different tests that you can take. Um, so I'll walk through each of them in turn, starting with the TOEFL, which is a test of English as a foreign language uh, exam. Um, this is one of the most common ones, but again, students do not have a preference between the exams unless otherwise noted on their website. So the TOEFL is out of 120 points. Uh, different schools have different minimum scores. At Penn, the minimum score is 100, but also know that we are looking at the breakdown of your subscores. We do want to see that you are proficient and performing strongly in all areas. So maybe you get a perfect score in one area, but you score really low in a different area. We will note that. So yes, we do require at least 100 as a score, but we're going to look and see that you have a more even breakdown amongst those subscores. Uh, we do not uh, we do not permit my best score, which could also be known as super scoring. We do look to see that you are submitting all of the scores. We want to make sure that you're comfortable on our campus. Our academic instruction is fully in English. And so we want to make sure that you are set up for success. And so that's why we don't allow uh, super scoring because we want to see what the full range of your English language skills are. We also accept the IELTS, a international English language testing system. The composite score could be out of nine and we require a minimum score of seven. Um, same thing that we would not permit a super score or just sending the best sub scores. Um, and then we do accept the Duolingo English test. It's out of 160 points. Uh, we do look for a minimum score of about 120. And again, we want to see balanced subscores in speaking and writing and listening and reading, et cetera. Know that those that we are looking to submit English language testing are those where English is not your first language. So it's not spoken at home. It's not your, uh, maybe you're bilingual and it was a second language that was also spoken very fluently. Um, so it's something that you've learned and you've been instructed in. Also know that we look for English language testing for students who have not been primarily taught in English in their secondary school. So if from your ninth grade all through your 12th grade, you were taught fully in English, every single class was taught in English, then we would not require uh, an English language proficiency test. If you are in an international school that is taught in a different language, but you have one class that is an English class, you're learning it as a foreign language, but that's your only ta class taught in English, we would still require English language proficiency testing. So 
if you're unsure, it's always better to take the tests and submit them um, than have the situation where you needed to submit the test and you didn't have it. So when in doubt, do take them. Um, and you know, if you ever have any questions, you can always reach out to the office of, a diff of the school that you're applying to. But know that for most international students, unless English is your native language or you were fully taught in English, for all of high school, all of secondary school, and it's all of your classes being taught in English, you probably do need to submit an English language testing um, exam. Um, know that we are most schools are not test optional for English language testing. So for example, at Penn, we are test optional for the SAT and the ACT. We are not test optional for any English language proficiency testing. It is um, not self-reported. You do need to submit official scores and we do not um, accept students that submit super scores or my best scores. You do need to submit all of your scores to us. We wanna see all of the breakdown and sub scores from each testing that you're submitting. Um, so, I hope that that's clear. And I know that there were other questions in the chat, so we can go over that a little bit more. Um, but now uh, Akosua is going to talk a little bit more about some of the other parts of the application. All right. So again, in thinking about different parts of the application, right, I'm gonna start first with thinking about your extracurricular activities. And extracurriculars, we're not asking ourselves what you're involved in, but the why. A, going back to earlier slide talking about the rumors you're thinking about with these institutions, right? I think people will say, well, they want to see this one thing in your extracurriculars. No, it's about the why you're doing these extracurriculars, which is unique to you and your circumstances and your context. We're not looking for everyone to have the same extracurricular activities because as we're thinking about what we, I discussed early in building a community, we don't ever want to be the same in terms of the, the, the activities and then the um, what they've learned in those activities. So we want to better understand why you are involved in, in this extracurricular activity. And then, right, and using the space thoroughly and thinking about those, those extracurriculars curriculars and thinking about the specifics that you, you would like to provide. For the Common App, for example, you only get 10, 10 areas to provide extracurricular activities in, in, in that, that part of the application. You are certainly able to provide us with a resume as well, but with that, that earlier piece of describing your extracurriculars, providing that, that clear information about and thinking about why you chose to add that to, to it is very important. And being able to fully describe the extracurricular activities. And that means thinking about the time that you spend doing the extracurricular activities, how many if you have team members in that extracurricular activity, trying to highlight those team members. If you're a leader in that extracurricular activity, highlighting that as well. When you're thinking about your essays, right? The essay components, we should want to learn more about you. And we want to learn about your, your context and your histories. Essays are my favorite parts of learning about a student because we get to learn your, your unique voice um, from students who, who are change makers and in the world around them, who students are asking really important questions. It's really important for you to use your voice. I very much acknowledge and seeing um, some families and counselors here, you are, are great supports for students. And it's really important for students, again, to utilize those supports around you and there be part of your, I call them your team, your, your cheer squad, people who are cheering you on as you go through this process. They should be able to edit and provide you some feedback. But at the end of the day, your voice should be front and center because you are the one who will be going to these institutions and who will be in this space is adding your unique voice to it as well. So in that case, your, your voice should be front and center. And that requires a lot of editing and that requires a lot of processes and, and thinking about what do I want to talk about? Is this something that I seek to share? It's really about comfortability with you and what you seek to share with the institution overall. Um, but again, your voice should be front and center. And then thinking about the students, the school specific essays or supplements, right? It's really important that you answer the question, right? Um, so with, with the Along with the Common App or Coalition App, there are also a lot of times schools will add extra questions that you will be you will need to answer, and that is either called a school specific essay or a supplement. And it's really important for you to answer that question. I again, again, going to the essays and the and the supplements is difficult. I'm sure Madeline can tell you, and I can tell you, is even for us, it was difficult to think about what to write about because it's, it's very specific. There's sometimes you're short. It's a, a 
quick, maybe five, four, five, six sentences that you need to, to talk specifically about. It's also important to check the word count that you are required to use for these, these writings. And it's important to be specific. As you write it and go back to the question, ask yourself, am I answering this question? If I, if I got rid of the question and asked somebody to read it, will they be able to get a sense of, of what I'm trying to answer? And that's really important to continue to ask yourself. And that requires time and that requires edits. So that doesn't mean writing the supplement and those essays the 20 minutes perhaps before it is due is really important to start early and in starting early you're able to have um, a team with you to perhaps to help you look through it and for you to continue to edit and think about what you want to talk about and again we are not asking for a specific thing for you to write about in the questions yes but the way in which you answer it, I mean, making sure you're adding those specifics and answering those questions fully, we again want to better understand you and for your voice to be front and center. Right. And so for some schools, they, they offer an interview. And if it is offered, for some schools, the, the interview, you, you perhaps will ask for the interview. For Penn, for example, interviews are are provided by the, our alumni who are the ones who do the interview. So you will get an email, you do not request it. An interview, as I said earlier, we can rephrase this to a conversation rather than the big scary word of interview. So it's a conversation to have with the institution, right? A friendly conversation, they'll ask you questions, but feel free again to ask them questions. It is within your, your process to ask them questions about perhaps if they are alumni of the institution, their experience at the institution, and if there's somebody else conducting the interview, perhaps an admissions um, counselor asking them for the questions that you may have about the experience at the institution. It is a conversation and it's not a one-way conversation. So really utilizing that space to your benefit is really important. Awesome. So I'm going to share a couple of quick tips and then a COSO well, and then we'll jump into Q&A. So we often get the students, what do you, the question from students, what are you looking for? What quality should I have? And the reality is we just want you to be yourself. We just want to get to know you. There's no one thing we're looking for. There isn't an activity we want everybody to do. There isn't a single phrase or topic that we're looking for. We want to know who you're going to be on our campus. And so be genuine and authentic in your application. Knowing that the whole process is holistic, knowing that what, no one thing is going to get you in or keep you out. So really just be candid in the way that you're presenting yourself. Make sure that you are the captain of this ship. You will, of course, have those cheerleaders and that support system, Akosawa mentioned. But at the end of the day, your family, they can come visit and see you on campus, but you are the one who's going to be moving to a new home for four years. So make sure that you are making those big decisions and make sure that you thank those who have helped you get to this incredibly uh, exciting opportunity to be able to look forward to post-secondary education. Make sure that you are following your instincts, get in touch with your gut feelings, and remember that this is just four years of your life. This is not a referendum on who you are as a person or your intelligence. It really is just trying to find the fit for you and the fit for us. And then make sure that you're big, give putting your best foot forward and really showing yourself in the best light. A couple more tips from Okosua. All right, <clears throat> and to close it out, right, stay organized. As I said earlier, does not mean writing your essays or, or scrambling a week before everything is due to get everything organized. So making sure you're staying organized, right, and making sure you have all your components ready so you, you're not racing and scrambling at the end. Well, many of you may be people who wait till the last minute, but perhaps this is not the time to practice that. <laughs> so making sure you have everything set. It's also important to build relationships with teachers and counselors and your mentors as well. Um, and in building that, those relationships, you're able to, to get a sense of, of the institution um, and, to, and for you and your counselors to also get the support for your recommendations as well. So to communicate, I see a lot of you in our, our multiple questions that we have here, you're already on the right track asking questions. And if your, your questions aren't answered here, again, you, you're able to, to utilize our, our mailing system, which we'll go over later. Um, but in different institutions, they, they have emails, they have different communication methods. So asking questions, if you're confused, the best, the first thing and the best thing to do is ask questions. So you better understand what is going on in a very, in a very new system for many of you. 
So it's also important to get to know your, your school. As you're asking those questions, take advantage of those in-person and virtual tours that you're able to do. A lot of schools um, post-COVID and even during um, have virtual tour so you get a sense of the institution you're not you may not be able to go there physically but you get a virtual tour in, of the institution going to those virtual information and information sessions and workshops as you're doing now so you're on the right track a plus for you right so you're able to to go to those things and, and get a sense of the institution because you're trying to understand the, the best fit for you and and how you want to thrive in that institution and really importantly don't compare yourself to others certainly do not compare yourself to the peers and and especially when it comes time to to getting the the, the word back from institutions not to compare yourself to others as madeline said stated beautifully it's not a reference random of, of who you are is just a moment and a blip in time, right? Making sure you understand that you're yourself, you are more than enough and you and your histories and the context that you're bringing is exceptional in its own way. So really important not to compare yourself to others. And again, discussing your financial aid with family members early, your support groups early to get a sense of what is able to be done. Many institutions will offer different kinds of, of financial aid systems. So going back again to asking the questions and doing your research and starting early, being able to understand the different policies available at the institutions is very important to having those discussions with your, your family as well. And also being being purposeful with your applications and, you, and, and to increase the likelihood of, of admission, right? Being purposeful, thinking about having the schools that may be more what we call a reach school, um, schools that you, you, are, you call a safety school, but overall those schools should, all should be schools that you're really interested in, right? Overall, the schools that you select will be a spaces where you think I can see myself in, is a space that I, I seek to thrive across those institutions. And lastly, keep an open mind and get excited about your future is a new part of your life. You're here, family members and, and, and counselors who are here, you're supporting your students in this new and exciting adventure. And wherever you land, it's, it's really important to get excited about it and to, to continue to ask questions. And most importantly, to, to very much understand that you are the, the person that institutions are seeking to admit and you are enough and we're excited to learn more about you. And with that, we're going to start with our Q&A. I already see questions coming in. Um, Madeline can kick us off in asking the questions. And then we'll, with the time that we have left, we're able to answer a few questions. So if we do not get to your question, again, please email us and we'll provide our email information at the end. Um, so you will find a way to contact us as well. So uh, one question that we're seeing a lot is about extracurriculars, um, what you should or shouldn't be doing, and does that need to relate to your intended major? And the answer is no, it does not need to relate to your intended major. If you are interested in studying business, you do not need to have business experience. If you want to be an English major, you do not need to have written a book. If you want to be an engineer, you do not need to be engaged in engineering extracurriculars. Keep in mind that you may come into college with an idea of what you want to study, and that may change. Switching majors, switching programs, it really looks different at every institution, but exploration is very much a part of the undergraduate experience. So you do not need to have extracurriculars related to your intended major or program of study. Um, if you do, you could share about how those have informed what you want to do, but we recognize that not every student has access to activities related to majors. Further, you may not know what major you will eventually land on. A lot of high schools don't offer programs or extracurriculars or even courses related to the many, many majors that American institutions have. So do what you are passionate about, do what you enjoy, because if you're excited about it, we are excited about it and happy to learn more about how you've engaged and contributed to that community. Another note that I'll say is if you have a part-time job, or family responsibilities or something that may not be considered a traditional sort of extracurricular. We still value those very much and we still wanna learn about that. So don't feel like you should only be sharing things that you're doing through school or through a formal community engagement. We do value other types of contributions to your community. I'm also seeing a lot of questions here around interviews and going over the interview policy. Lisa Penn, we, provide interviews. Our alumni are the ones who do interviews. They will add, they will email you um, once you start your application 
application process about getting an interview, you yourself as a student do not request an interview. And the other part of that is that sometimes to students and thinking about not comparing yourself to others in your school may get interviews and you may not get one. If you do not get an interview, it is in no way a reflection of who you are or your application overall. The, the interviews or alumni do a wonderful job and it's really just about capacity that they have um, to be able to pro provide those interviews. So you, at least for Penn, you are not requesting an interview. You, you reach out to you about the interview. That being said, if, make sure you're checking the email that you're using to apply to these institutions and check your spam folder. And there's that area where in, um, emails that you're the interview deemed, the interview, the email deemed as something that it, it's not worth for you to look at, making sure you're checking that specific folder for spam. Sometimes those, those requests go through that to that folder that sort of keeps it out of your mail, your main inbox. Make sure you're checking that to make sure that you're keeping up to date with what um, is being requested of you for the interview. And again, it is a conversation. It is, it's, it's, it's a conversation. I want to use a different word than interview because I see that it gets a little scary. So thinking about it as a conversation for you to have with the interviewer is really important as well to ask your questions about the institution. Um, I'm seeing a few questions about financial aid and eligibility. Remember, it varies at every school. So some questions ask about GPA or testing um, influencing your financial aid. That may be the case at some institutions you are applying to. Uh, at Penn specifically, GPA testing, none of that will influence your financial aid package. Um, if you are admitted as an international student that needs financial aid, we are need aware, but we do meet full need for full four years for financial aid if you're admitted as an international student that did apply initially. International students that need aid must apply for it at the time of first year application. If you think you're going to need aid, go ahead and apply for it. Once you get to campus and you've already been admitted, if you didn't initially apply for aid, we're not able to match you with aid afterwards. Just it's a set budget and we allocate that for all four years. If you are a US citizen or Canadian or Mexican citizen, but you uh, live abroad, you're going to school somewhere else, you would be considered an international student for application purposes, but as a domestic student and need blind for financial aid purposes. So financial aid just at Penn, it varies by school, but at Penn, we consider citizenship or permanent residency for financial aid, um, but where you go to school, you would still be considered an international student if it's not in the US. Okay, and then I think we have time for one more. And the questions, a lot of questions about ACTs and SATs. So I said, at least for Penn, we really are test optional um, for this upcoming cycle, for the 2023-2024 cycle. We don't have information about what will is to follow, but it's really important to check the policies of your different institutions that you're applying to, to get an understanding of what your policies around ACTs and SATs are. We are not optional for the English language testing. All right, so that is all the time we have for questions. If you have any more that we did not get to, I know we're sorry, um, but if you have the more questions that you have, you can provide, you can ask that to our email. Um, we also have virtual tours available for students as well. Madeline just provided that information, international team at admissions.upenn.edu. You can also find us on YouTube, on, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on TikTok. As I said, as you're scrolling through TikTok, please follow us at Penn, at Previewing Penn, on all social media sites um, to get a sense of, of Penn as well. Um, thank you for joining us today. You've been a wonderful crowd with all your questions. And I hope to see you in the mailboxes and our, our virtual um, tours. All right, have a good day, everyone. Bye.